It Is Well is one of my all-time favorite songs. I love, I believe it's the third verse. It says, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. His grace exceeds my sin. His grace exceeds your sin. And wherever it is, whatever it is, that the enemy, the liar, the accuser, keeps whispering in your ear to try and distract you from the grace, the all-encompassing grace of our Savior, there's a couple of things you need to know. First, he is a liar and the father of lies. He can't speak truth. It's not his native tongue. Lying is what he speaks. He is the deceiver. He's going to make all of those lies sound awfully right on. He wants to trick you into believing the lie, and he's the accuser of the brethren. He likes to point the finger. Thank God there's more than one person in this trial because we have an advocate before the Father. We have an intercessor who stands in on our behalf. And when the devil says, yeah, remember when he did this or remember when she did that, we have an advocate that says, no, I, I've covered that with my blood. That price has been paid. There is nothing owing to this debt. And I want you to, to know today something that, that, that we really have got to get knitted into our understanding and our being of, as a Christian is that our sin has been taken care of. It's been dealt with. Yes, we stumble. Yes, we sin. Yes, we're going to sin. That sin has been covered. The, the glorious thing about being a believer in Christ is that he has paid the sum total of all your sin. All of it. And then he stands before the Father and pleads your case. Not based on your merit, but based on his. So when the devil comes against you and he whispers those lies and he wants to get you stuck, wants to trap you in those things that you've done or maybe are doing, you can go, uh-uh, no, I have an advocate. My price has been paid. And walk in freedom. Walk in the joy and the liberty that is yours through Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, we, we started that with the song talking about joy and, and in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Now, I, I don't, I've worked most of my life to be content. Joy is kind of a step beyond that, that I kind of look at and go, okay, let me, let me get this far, and then I'll ponder that. Um, Christy has an amazing ability to have joy. Um, she, she astounds me. We, we each have areas that we are strong in, we have areas that we are weak in, and I think that's part of why Adam needed Eve, because he needed someone to complement his weaknesses. And Christy really offsets my weaknesses with her strengths. And, and there's times when, to, to be honest with you, you know, we're leaving tomorrow for this trip. You know, people are telling me, oh, you're going to have fun. I don't think about fun a lot. <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, I think about, I've got a four-hour car trip. And then I've got eight hours on a plane or in an airport. And, and then I've got to deal with the humidity and the heat in Houston, and then they're going to put me on a metal thing and stick me out in the water. <laughs> and in that metal thing, there's going to be a lot of people. Now, I absolutely love that I'm going to get to be with my family. I'm, I'm, I know God is going to bless that time. I know that's going to be good, but I don't, my brain doesn't wrap around fun a lot, okay? <laughs> and so when we talk about joy, I'm happy to be content because for so much of my life I've not been content and, 
And when, when people say, well, wow, man, he gets to go on this cruise, why is he not happy? Because I like my house, I like my chair, I like my bathroom, I like my deck, I like my bed. I don't need much beyond that. And, and if some of it had to go, it would be my chair, because I still want my bed and my bathroom. Okay? So, so I'm learning. I'm, I'm in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. I don't know what that looks like, except that I can see it in other people. Okay? And even when things are ugly and, and things are, are, are not going well, I can look at people that, that just seem to live in that fruit of the Spirit, where they just have joy. And, and it gives me hope, okay? Because if he could take me from someone that was by nature a, grum a grumbler and a complainer, who is a perfectionist at heart and nothing ever is going to be perfect, so why bother trying? And, and he could teach me to be content, to, to be satisfied with where I am and what he's given me, then, then he, he can bring that all the way through to joy. So um, I want to encourage you today. I don't say this because I'm there. I'm, I say this because that's somewhere I want to get. But, but to, to be in the presence of the Lord, there is joy, regardless of what's going on around you. That's, that's the marvelous thing about the fruit of the Spirit, is it's because His Spirit is indwelling us that these things can, can be exhibited in our life, when by nature we may not exhibit many or any of them. So, um, seek out joy. Be content. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let him get you off track. Don't let him uh, ru ruin your race before you've even started. Oh, you're never going to finish. You're, you're a slow runner. Jeepers crime me. Look how many times you stumbled. Do you see anybody else around you stumbling? You, you just need to give it up. No. We press on. We run the race as though to win the prize because we know that when we cross that line, there's a Savior on the other side with his arms open ready to receive us, to wipe away every tear. To, to comfort us and to bring us fullness of joy. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. Um, we have been talking about a family affair. We've worked the last two weeks in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. We've covered a couple of things about the creation, why man was created, why woman was created. We've looked at how things worked in the garden. And now if you have your Bibles, open to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm going to bounce around a little bit today. Um, I do not have an overhead for that. I apologize. I wasn't really sure where this was going, even last night. Um, I've got... I told Christy, it's kind of like the Gordian knot. I've got this string that I see, and this string leads me into a huge knot, and I'm not sure how to get into the, follow the string without getting into the knot. So I'm taking you into the knot with me, okay? So in Genesis 1, we see the creation. Genesis 2, we see that um, God goes back, or Moses goes back, by the leading of the Spirit, and he goes back to the sixth day, and he dwells in the sixth day, and, and then God created man, uh, he named all the creatures, God put him in the garden, and then God said there's not a suitable helper. We talked about that man was created from the dust, that in, in some way that we don't really understand, man is intrinsically connected to creation, and when there was not a suitable helper found, God did something unique in, in all of creation because up to this point, we've seen things that were created just because he said, let it be. We've seen things that were created out of the creation, all the things that came up of the, the dirt and the earth and the, the dust, God created and, and breathed into them life. And, but then he, he creates woman. And he creates woman out of man. And that's the only time that we see this, except kind of in a different view, when Jesus was born. Okay, and, and that one, it was kind of the reverse, because he created the Messiah, the Christ, out of woman without man. Okay, so um, unique in all of creation. And then chapter 3. 
And we're going to read a little bit, and here's where things get ugly. Okay? So in verse 1, we're just going to read down here for a little bit. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Now I don't know about you, but I'd have been freaked out right there. A talking snake. I don't like snakes to begin with, and I certainly would not like a snake to talk to me. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord of God, the Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. <clears throat> but the Lord called to the man and said to him, "Where are you?" And he said, "I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself." He said. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? This is where it gets good. Okay. This is, this is where it gets good. This is, this is where the original blame game started. Okay. Pass the buck. The man said, The woman whom you gave to me she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. See, God, I'm innocent in this. I mean, at the least, it was her fault because she gave it to me, but at the most, it's your fault because you gave her to me. Boy, did you screw up. We, we still do that, don't we? Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I'm just going to stop right there. Um, well, they had one good day. <laughs> Scripture doesn't tell us where, how long, what the intermediary was here. We don't know how many days from the sixth day until this happened. Uh, all we know is that at some point after the sixth day, this happened. Okay. Um, as a direct result of sin, the relationship between man and woman, husband and wife, was forever tainted. All relationship was tainted. Um, we see that the serpent comes in, and, and if you 
if you ever have a few minutes free, it's interesting to take a look at the temptation in the Garden of Eden and the temptation in the wilderness and take a look and see how the devil plays because if you don't think the devil knows you, you're wrong because he's going to speak to you right at your weakness and he's going to speak to you where, where you are most vulnerable and um, he probably knows the word better than you do. Okay? Uh, we see in the temptation in the garden, he quoted scripture. As a matter of fact, when he's confronting Eve, nothing had been written yet, and, and he says, is this really what God said? Now, people will oftentimes pick up on a little lie, but it's amazing how many people miss the big lie. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, you want proof of this, just look at World War II and Nazi Germany. Okay? The, the very idea that a Christian nation, and I use Christian in quotes, because um, what they did was very obviously not of Christ, but, but a Christian nation that could be deceived into believing that they were the superior race and, and that they had a right by their very being to destroy any race that they saw not fit to be on the planet. And, and of that was primarily the Jews, but we also know that a lot of the Polish were killed, we know that a lot of gypsies were killed. That we, we know that anything that, that basically the, the leadership thought was unworthy was just to be eliminated. Um, and yet we had an entire nation that went along with it. And, and um, we, we still see things like that going on today. Okay? So they're in the garden, the serpent comes in, he talks to the woman, she's not surprised, so obviously there was some kind of communication that, that, that they had that we don't have because my dogs don't understand me half as well as the snake understood her. And, and um, as a matter of fact, my grandchildren don't understand me half as well as the snake understood her. And uh, the serpent comes in, he confronts her, first he questions the reality of what was. Is this really what he said? And she says, well, we can eat of any of the fruit except of this tree, and, and that we're not allowed to even touch. Now, I don't know if God amended his, his directive to Adam somewhere between chapter 2 and chapter 3, but we know in chapter 2, God told Adam, do not eat of the fruit. He didn't say anything about touching it. I don't know why that's significant, but it's in there, so I think it's important. Um, but I, I, I personally, I think it's the same thing we do. God says, don't do this. So we back up a step and draw a line so we don't cross that line to get to the thing we're not supposed to do. So I think this was the start of the whole thing of backing off of what God wants us to do and, and then binding yourself up with legalism. And all of a sudden you end up with how many, how many laws and regulations, Dennis? 613. 613. 613 laws. Okay. And so... Um, but then, but then the devil confronts her, or the serpent confronts her with the big lie. Nah, you're not going to die. As a matter of fact, you're going to become like God, knowing good and evil. Now, up to this point, what had Adam and Eve known? Good. We see everything that God created. He said it was good, and on the sixth day, he said it was very good. So the only thing they knew was good. They didn't know evil. They didn't know what that was. Um, couple of things that we're going to draw out of this story. Why, why is this significant when we're talking about family relationships? Right here is the root of why family relationships are so often broken. It's why so few family relationships work anywhere near like what God designed and intended them to work like. Um, we see in chapter 2 that God created man and put him as a steward over all of the earth. He says, this is yours. I want you to go out to have dominion and subdue it. Now, we, we don't understand that that was a stewardship because we look at subdue and dominion as very powerful, very strong, striking words and, and oftentimes out of context with what God is intending here because you notice he didn't give any of it to man. He said, take care of it. Scripture makes it very clear. It's all God's. It's all his. Okay? And then God said, well, he needs a helper in this and, and so he created 
woman who was to help man, and they worked together. I don't know what it looked like. I'm, I'm guessing that Adam took care of naming the animals, and Eve named all those weird flowers and fruits. You know? Um, I, I would not have come up with the word pomegranate. Okay? I would have probably come up with apple with thick skin and fruity seeds, which, you know, is, is kind of hard to say. So, so I think they were working together, and I think they complemented each other, and I think that uh, Eve was able to help Adam to accomplish everything that he did, and in doing so, she accomplished everything that God had directed her to do. Now, we're, we're going to get into this thing here, and, and I'm going to step on toes, okay? And I'm, I want to apologize if I hurt you, but I'm not going to apologize for the word. Okay? Um, my intent is not to offend anyone. My intent is to share with you what God says, how things are supposed to work. Okay? So we see the curse that comes in. Um, did you ever want really bad to do something and when you did it, you realized it was a train wreck and it was not a good thing? Um, you know, you don't want to find that out about hang gliding or parachuting. <laughs> so, um, my, I have a brother who is deathly afraid of heights. Um, he, somehow or another, he was living in San Diego, he was in the Navy at the time, he got connected with this group that uh, would help people overcome their fears. And so, as part of this, uh, they were going to have him parachute out of an airplane to help him overcome his fear. He's still alive, so, so don't, you know. Um, well, bad enough that, you know, you're, you're going to confront your fear by doing one of the most scary things there is. But then they brought the news people in, and they actually did a story on this, this group that, and how they were helping overcome fears, and they chose my brother to be a part of that. And they interviewed him beforehand and, and how he didn't like heights and what they were going to do. They were going to buddy jump, and they're, you know, they, they show him getting the stuff all zipped up and packed on and getting on the plane, and the plane goes up, and they're talking, and the, the instructor's telling him what he needs to do, and, okay, we're getting ready to do this, and then you see him go out, to, well, but Keith didn't go. He stayed on the plane. <laughs> For which I, I commend him. I mean, it's a dangerous enough thing that you get into something that's made you go up in the air, but then why in the world do you want to jump out of that? I don't know. But, so, so Keith still has a little bit of that fear going on there. But, uh, you know, when, when God created things, he created them to work in order. We see in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians tells us that God is a God of order, not of disorder. Okay? And when Adam and Eve were in the garden, there's a couple things I want you to see in this story, in this narrative. The first thing is, let me change that, not this story, this history, um, because this is not a fictitious tale. The first thing is that um, Adam or the, the serpent attacked Eve right where she was weak. He offered her something that she felt she needed, something that she desired, something that was beyond what was given to her. Um, he said, you will become like God. Now, I don't know what um, the dynamic of the relationship was between God and Adam and Eve, but we know that God came into the garden and we know this was not unexpected because Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they went and hid themselves because they knew he was going to show up. And I believe this was pre-incarnate Christ, that he came and, and he dwelt in the garden with them in the cool of the evening, and they walked in the garden. And I think um, he might have asked Adam or Eve what, what names they might have come up for, pomegranate or platypus. And, and then they talked about the things that were going on, and they had fellowship. They, they had fellowship. Face-to-face, -face, intimate fellowship. And would any of you like that? Yeah. To, to, to have work that was not toil, but that was a delight to do, to have someone that worked with you lockstep to accomplish that, and to be able to take the time in the evening to just spend in the presence of your creator. Mm -hmm. But would any of us be content if somebody offered us more. 
You see, that's what he did. He, he offered Eve more. And scripture tells us that Eve was deceived. Okay? But what's, what's really interesting is if we look at the curses that, that come out of this thing, uh, we look at uh, the curse for the, the serpent. You're going to crawl on your belly. You're going to eat the dust. Um, there's, there's a couple of things here, though, that I want to show you. Um, God says there will be enmity between the snake and the woman. I am absolutely biblical and scriptural when I have no desire to ever see or touch or be around a snake. Okay? I don't like them. I don't... Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I, I'm sure there's a purpose for them on the earth somewhere, just not around me, okay? Um, they became enemies of man, all right, the serpent. And we know from other passages down the road that the serpent <coughs> is the, the symbolic entity of the devil. Uh, Jesus calls him that ancient serpent, the devil. Uh, we see in Revelation that the, the serpent, the dragon, will come and, and wage war against uh, the woman and, and her child, and then ultimately against her people. Uh, we see throughout Scripture that any time that there is a serpent uh, reference, whether it be an actual serpent or, or possibly Leviathan or, or the dragon, it's always with a negative light. It's never with a positive. Okay? Now... Um, I don't know. Scripture doesn't tell me. You know, was that was the serpent possessed? I I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, it doesn't tell me, so I don't think it's important that I do know. I know that the devil used the serpent, or appeared in the guise of the serpent, or there was some kind of connection there between the devil and the serpent. Um, but then he says something very interesting. He says, um, not just between you and uh, her offspring. It uh, says a serpent, uh, or he says uh, her offspring, and, and some of your Bibles, if you have your Bible, does it say something different than offspring? Descended. I'm sorry? Descended. Descended, okay. Anybody else? Seed. Seed. Now, it's interesting here, because I've looked this word up in the Hebrew, uh, and, and it can, any one of these is, is a possible translation for it, an accurate translation for it. But what's interesting about this is, in the New Testament, when Paul refers back to this situation, uh, he's in uh, Galatians chapter 3. Let's, let's turn there real quick. Um, Galatians chapter 3. Um, verse 16. This is something that we need to understand because I've, I've spoken repeatedly that I don't believe there is any word in Scripture that is there by accident. Everything is in there specifically because God wanted it there. Okay? So when he says um, offspring or descendants or seed, it's important, and we see why in Galatians 3, verse 16, uh, Paul is writing, he said, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Okay, so we see in the midst of the very first curse, we see a prophetic statement of deliverance. Okay? Now, when God is speaking to the serpent, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Um, if you step on the head of a snake, what happens to the snake? It pretty much dies. If the serpent bites your heel, what happens to you? Well, it kind of depends on the serpent. But, you know, at the worst, it's possible you could die. We see right here an illustration, a picture of Calvary, an illustration of the cross. Now, when Jesus was in the temptation in the desert, 
It says that the devil left him for a more opportune time. Okay? And we see that periodically the enemy comes in, but we don't recognize it as the enemy because he comes in the guise of other people. He comes in the guise of the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees and, and the scribes and, and the Herodians and those that set themselves up against Jesus. And, and he's working to undermine everything Jesus is doing. We see this contest going on and on, back and forth and back and forth. And then we come to the cross. And the serpent definitely bruised the heel of the seed. Because in his not understanding God's plan, he did exactly what God intended. And he nailed the son of, of the almighty God to the cross and, and killed him. Okay? Oh, but God is so much better a planner. Okay? Because see, before God ever spoke a word of creation into existence, the God had already decided that man was going to sin and that man was going to need a savior from that sin and that the only way that a savior could be provided for man who had sin was for a, a sinless man to be made. And since a sinless man couldn't be made from man, it had to be made of God. And the son submitted himself to the father's authority and he came and took the place, our place, on the cross. And he became the, the, the precious lamb, the, the, blem, the lamb without blemish that was a sacrifice in our place. Now, if the story ended there, the blood was shed in our behalf and, and we are given freedom from our sin, sins. But God didn't stop there because he wanted to prove that the cross was enough. And so he raised Jesus up from the dead. And that's where our hope comes in, because if Jesus is not resurrected, then we won't be resurrected, and we're fools above all men. So we see at the cross this contentious battle, this fulfillment of prophecy, where the serpent strikes his heel, and, and Jesus strikes his head. We're going to see the, the final fulfillment of that in Revelation down the road, but this, this, this message is not about prophecy. I just want you to see that there's this whole thing that's working on here. Um, now... If, if the woman had an offspring that was Jesus, did the serpent have offspring? Well, sure he did. Matter of fact, Jesus called some people out for being the offspring of the devil. Matter of fact, he calls out the religious leaders. And he tells them, you, you, you can't even speak the truth because you're listening to your father. If you were listening to my father, you would believe me and we wouldn't be having this conversation, but you're not listening to my father. You're listening to your father who is the devil. Okay? Satan has offspring out there too and they're working very hard to, to work against the church. Okay? So we're going to see more of his offspring uh, as the antichrists, Christ's, little a, plural, uh, continue to rise and ultimately in, in the guise of the Antichrist and the dragon and the false prophet. So we see this curse given to the snake. Now, I only said that because I wanted you to see the connection, the correlation between her seed and his seed, his offspring. Now, now we see the curse of the woman. Um, just, just out of curiosity, um, how many women in here have, have born children? Put your hands up. Um, did it hurt? Oh. <laughs> Go back to Genesis 3. We see the blame game. God sees through the blame game. Real quick question. When God came into the garden, did he need to ask where Adam and Eve were? No. Now, you don't want to play hide and seek with God. It never ends well. And so when, when they're in the garden, it's not because God didn't know where they were. He wanted man to come to him. Okay? And when he came out, um, he said, uh, why are you hiding? He says, well, because we're naked. We don't even fathom that. We pretty much know when we're naked, right? You know, uh, it's not really a surprise to us. Um, actually, there are exceptions to that. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I can think of several examples in, in the lives of my children and grandchildren where I'm not altogether convinced they realized they were naked. Um, I won't tell the story, bitch. <laughs> 
I'm going to tell a story. <laughs> How old was Benjamin? Four. Four. I thought he was like 16. <laughs> no, Benjamin was about four. Uh, it was in the summertime, and, and Christopher and Donovan had gone out to play on the trampoline and in the sprinkler. And Benjamin was inside, and he decided that he was going to go outside and play with them. We told him, okay, you got to get your swimsuit, up, your swimsuit on, so go change, and then you can go out and play with your brothers. So, I, I don't know. Four hours later, I don't know, it was probably maybe 10 minutes, I don't know. I, I went, I had to go into my room to get something. And as I'm walking by, Benjamin and Mackenzie's room was across the hall from mine and Christie's. And as I'm walking by, I hear somebody in the room. Okay, well, Christy and I had already determined that Benjamin is her child. <laughs> and they, that she connected him in a way that, that Benjamin and I don't connect because their brain operates in the same way, okay? And I'm, I'm walking by the room and I hear this noise and so I kind of back up and I look in the room. Hmm. Sweetie, could you come here please? What, come here. Can you please explain to me what he's doing? And so she puts her head in the room and she starts laughing. Benjamin is in there butt naked Squatting, I don't know how he does it, I can't do it, but he, he squats so his, his feet are on the ground and nothing else is, but he's squatted, he's like in a little ball, and he's playing with robots and monsters. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't get that, because I know when I'm naked, <laughs> and there's usually not anything more important when I'm naked than being not naked. <laughs> And so Christy starts laughing. She said, I know exactly what happened. He went into his room, and he started getting undressed, and he saw the toys that were laying there for where he was playing with them earlier, and his mind started working, and, and he started playing with his toys. So I guess it is possible for you to be naked and not realize that you're naked. We have living proof of it. Did you remember you were naked? Not at the time. Yeah. Okay. So, so key clue right here. You know, Adam goes, uh, we were naked. Well, God, automatically, uh, oh, yeah, you're naked. That's how I made you. Um, and so who told you were naked? And then, then the blame game starts. And, and, but see, here's the thing. We're gonna, I've gotta, I'm going to wrap this nugget up real tight right here. And then we're going to get into um, how this, this Gordian knot is unraveled in the New Testament. So today I'm going to leave you all knotted up. Okay? <laughs> Okay? As a matter of fact, I'm going to challenge you to go in and start seeing if you can start plucking the threads of this knot to see how God intended it to work so that thing will come out straight and lay smooth and, and be able to be used. Okay? So we talk about the curse from the snake, and then we talk about the curse to the woman. I will multiply your pain in childbearing. Now, I, I don't know, I'm not all that great at math, but I know multiplication is more than addition. Okay, so if I have two and I add two to it, I get four. If I have two and I multiply two to it, I get four. Hmm, okay, that seems pretty similar. But if I have two and I add 14 to it, I get 16. And if I have two and I multiply it by 14, I end up with 28, and it just gets bigger and bigger. Now, God doesn't tell us the rate at which it's going to be multiplied. I think because some people it was by two, and I think for some people it was by 14. Okay? But I know that, that the, the pain in childbirth, and, and actually the, the idea behind this is not just the childbirth, but also the raising of the children, um, it's difficult, it's hard, and it's painful. Okay? And it doesn't just end at childbirth. I remember after uh, Christopher was born, uh, that was one of the few times that Christy ever had any kind of postpartum, and she was sitting there looking at him and she was crying. And I thought, well, that's odd. Why are you crying? And she was trying to share with me, he will never love me as much as I love him. And I know moms feel that. There's a connection there. I think that's part of the uniqueness of your creation because you were brought out of man and you bring forth man from yourself. There's that connection. There's that, that thing that... Dads and kids don't have. Not to say dads and kids don't have a connection, but
but it's it's not because of that 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 biological connection. Okay, so there will be pain not just in the birthing, but also in the rearing and the raising of them. And then he says, "Your desire shall be for your husband." Does somebody else have a different reading there? Uh, verse 16, the last part of it. It says, your desire shall be for your husband. Against. Your desire shall be against your husband. Anyone else? Huh? See, this is, this is an interesting passage because it does not translate well into English. Okay? Most biblical scholars, as a matter of fact, every scholar that I looked up to get their insight on this, whether they were uh, Hebrew scholars or, or Christian theolo uh, theologians, they all said the same thing within the same context. That this is not saying that, that Eve is going to want Adam. This is not saying that Christy is going to want Len. This is not saying that Shelley is going to want Tim. Okay? Those things come about biologically and then through dis conscious decision in addition to the biology. The idea that is being portrayed here is that her desire is going to put her in contest with her husband. Mm -hmm. She is going to be striving with her husband. Now, how do we come to this conclusion? Well, the, the Hebrew leaves it a little vague, but when you look back to what the sin was, and then you see how the curse was applied because of the sin, what was Eve trying to do? She was trying to become like God. She was, she was telling the Creator, she was telling Almighty God, I am not satisfied with what you have placed me. I want to exceed that. The devil got her in the same thing that got him. Because he did the same thing. He said, I will exalt myself above the heavens. I will place my, myself on the throne in the mountains of the north. I will be like God. Okay? So we see that, that the deception that, that Eve fell for was that she was going to desire something that God did not desire for her. And we see in this curse that God is laying out for all of mankind the contentious relationship between husbands and wives. And, and it's not women, it's not all your fault. Okay? I, I want to make that very clear here. Because when we get into this thing, because of the way the world has taken this thing and the way sin has corrupted this thing, and, and then you add into that all of the uh, designs of our culture, it's become this huge mass of knot that it was never intended to be. Okay, And it says, uh, your desire shall be for your husband or for, against your husband. You will want his place. And then notice what it says here. He shall rule over you. Now, man was not intended to rule over woman. He was intended to be the caretaker of all creation, of which woman was part of. He would be her caretaker. She was designed to help him. There was no contention in that relationship because each had a role to fill. One was not better than the other. Okay? One was not better than the other. If Adam was not capable of doing the task that God gave him, he would have said, gosh... I guess I'm going to have to make a second Adam to help him out. No. He needed a complementary partner. Somebody that could help his weaknesses. And that he could help her weaknesses. Now, going back to the garden, the serpent, the woman, she eats the fruit. What was Adam doing? He was right there with her. Adam was not deceived. It was because Adam sinned that sin entered the world. Scripture tells us Eve was the one that was deceived, but Adam, who was there with her, sinned. Look at what God says to the man. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, you shall not eat. You have to take all of those things as one thought. He wasn't cursed because he listened to his wife, men. This is not carte blanche for you to just, oh, you, you're a woman, I can ignore anything you say. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is that Eve spoke to her husband something that was in direct contravention, in direct opposition to what God had told Adam. 
And instead of holding fast to what God had told him, he followed the advice of his wife. He followed her counsel. Okay? Not because women, when you have advice and insight for your husband, that, you, that, that is God-given, that is God-ordained. We'll see that as we get into the unraveling of the knot in the New Testament. But, but when you lead your husbands astray, you are duplicating the sin from the garden. Husbands, as much as you love your wives and as much as you love peace in the house and you don't want contention, if God has given you a directive and your wife is leading you opposite, it's the same sin as the garden. We have to hold fast to what God has given us, both men and women. We can't let the enemy deceive us. We can't allow ourselves to be taken off track. We can't be our, allow ourselves to be removed from what we know God's will is for us. Okay? How do we know that will? He gave us a guidebook. He, he gave us instructions. And beyond that, he gave us his spirit that will lead us. Okay? So... I'm going to wrap it up here. I didn't get nearly as far as I was hoping to. We see the curse comes in. All of creation is cursed. All of it is suffering the effects of the curse. Be, and you see that in the curse that Adam gets? Uh, because you listened to your wife and you ate of the tree which I told you not to eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. And all of a sudden work became toy. Okay? So we have this now at the beginning of... of uh, I won't say the beginning. Yeah, at the beginning of sin, we have this mess because Eve didn't do what she was supposed to do and Adam surely didn't do what he was supposed to do. She listened to the serpent. He did not defend her and protect her from the lie that the serpent was giving. She ate of the fruit and turned and said, here, it's good. And he went, oh, okay. Not thinking for himself, he ate of the fruit. And now we have a relationship dynamic that was never intended of creation where man and woman will contend with one another for who's going to rule the house. Okay? Now, I'm going to leave it there because this is the way the world has seen this type of relationship since then. Thank God that we have the New Testament that corrects that wrong thinking for us.